Good afternoon, I believe ministries. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to welcome you to our weekly I Believe Ministry Bible study, where our goal is to uplift the name of, of Christ, to glorify his word, to strengthen the believer in his knowledge of his word. And having the knowledge of his, her, of his word is having the knowledge of his will. And we as believers are greatly strengthened by knowing his word and his will. But even more than that, we are greatly blessed by believing in his word and his will and living according to what we believe. In other words, making decisions to walk in what we know about God's word and his will with total confidence that he will do what he said he would do. And that what he promised that will come to pass will definitely come to pass. If we just trust and believe, we just live according to his ways and his will, then he will do what he said he would do. And in doing so, we are then equipped with everything we need to overcome all that we face here on this earth. Because when we decide to live for Christ, then we are enlisted into an army, the army of Christ. And then we have a, an enemy. We inherit an enemy that is the enemy of Christ, and that is Satan. And Satan's job is to attack Christ and his army to try to defeat all that Christ has done, all that love him and live for him, to destroy and, 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 and ruin anything that belongs to Christ. And so that is that makes us have a, a natural enemy. A supernatural enemy, a spiritual enemy, and we are under attack. But we have no fear. We should have no fear because our Lord and Savior, our leader, our Lord, our King, He has already given us the victory. He has already secured the victory. And He has equipped us with all that we need to overcome the wiles of the devil the strategies of Satan and overcome the persecution and the attacks that we face here on earth. But in order for us to do that, we have to know our power. We have to know uh, the promises of God. We have to know the resources that we have. We have to know the strength that we live in because without knowing, it says for a lack of knowledge, my people perish. Without knowing these things, the devil can deceive. He can usurp what God has uh, given us. So he can't take it, but we can give it away or we cannot claim it because we don't know or, uh, or, or have a lack of knowledge of it. But we as believers, we are studying daily. We are praying daily to, to better understand God's ways, his will, and to know the power and the strength that we live in and believe it and act on it. And those principles that I've just highlighted in our introduction are principles that are brought out in our lesson today. We have a, a, a character today in our story that is a very famous character in the Bible. And we've, um, many times we've all had lessons or Bible studies or sermons um, dealing with this particular character. And I assure you, you can't learn enough about him because the more you learn about him, the more you learn about how what he was driven by, who he trusted, what he was able to do, the more we are equipped to do the same thing and to, and to uh, be driven and, and be guided and, and, and are equipped to do the same thing in our lives. All right. So in knowing that, we look at our title for our lesson today. Don't be afraid. 
But remember, so many titles and different aspects came to mind when I was trying to decide on a title for our lesson. But I, I was settled on don't be afraid, but remember. Don't be afraid, but remember. And our main character today is Nehemiah. Nehemiah. And our text comes from the entirety of the book of the, uh, not the entirety of the book, but the entirety of chapter four in the book of ne Nehemiah. And we are going to highlight some things in this chapter that, we, and we're going to glean from these things and we're going to prayerfully hope that these things uh, equip us to, to, to be ready for the fight, to be ready to face the opposition that we face because we are a believer in Christ Jesus and we live our life according. All right, today I will read from the NIV. Very seldom do I do that initially, but today I will. Um, because we have about 20 chapter, 20 verses we will read, and I want it to get to read in a manner where we can easily follow it. All right, Nehemiah, fourth chapter. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. Nehemiah says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Verse 6 says, so we rebuilt. Verse 5, they prayed. Verse 6, they, they rebuilt. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, halfway there. For the people worked with what? All their hearts. Now I want to read that part right there again in the, in the King James, because I truly love the King James interpretation and translation of that. It says, in the NIV, they work with all their heart. And the King James Version said, for the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. What a challenge to us as believers. All right, for the people had a mind to work. Verse 7 in NIV. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed, uh, again, we see a weapon of mass destruction, a weapon of strength. We see a tool that Nehemiah is using, he has a habit of using, we can glean from that and we can grow from that very simply. But we prayed, we prayed, he, he prayed, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Notice what they said. We are getting weak and there is so much rubbish. There's so much trash. There's so much garbage that we cannot rebuild the wall. I'd like to quickly give you a question and a challenge for each and every one of us. Do we have so much nothingness, rubbish, trash in our life that we can't change our ways for the better? That we can't reach a higher level in Christ and in our life because of the rubbish and the trash that's in our life. What they mean, like we can't stop watching social media. We can't stop watching TV. We can't stop 
doing habits that are preventing us from being our best self, that's trash, that's rubbish. And those things tire you out and it prevents you from being your best and living your best life in Christ Jesus. It's a challenge to us. That's what they're saying to us. They're saying it's literally because of the trash that was there because of the wall, but it's speaking to us spiritually. That's the challenge. If so, get rid of the word rubbish. Just get rid of the rubbish because it's trash and it's preventing you from being your best and accomplishing your goals in Christ. Verse 11. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. First, their, their enemies were angry. Then their enemy uh, was sarcastic. Now their enemies are sending threats. Threats that they're going to kill them. Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. The enemy does not want us to be what Christ has created us to be or do what Christ has purpose for us to do, to do his will and to walk in his ways and to accomplish mighty things in his name. The enemy does not want to see us do it. So it, it devises ways and strategies to prevent us from doing it. We have an opponent. And if you don't know this opponent is the same opponent for all of us. It's a common opponent. He may attack us different ways, but it's the same person. It's the same enemy. And now he's sending threats of death. Satan, John 10, 10 says, Satan comes but for, for what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give what? Life and life abundantly. Hold on to Jesus. Verse 12. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Wait a minute. Now, it's not the outside, the enemies that are telling us this now is the people on the inside are repeating the threats of our enemies. Wow. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. They came and told us 10 times over. Not necessarily the, the, the number count, but what they're saying is they repeatedly are saying, constantly are telling them the threats of the enemy. Now, what are threats designed to do? To try to get you to cower down, to quit, to turn back, to not do it. All right? The devil roars like a lion. <laughs> like a lion. But there's only one true lion <laughs> from the tribe of Judah who will reign. All right, verse 13. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at their exposed places posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, just didn't move without strategy. After I looked things over, I stood up, my Lord, and said to the nobles, the officials, and, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid afraid of them remember who remember the lord remember that's what our title comes from don't be afraid of them remember what the lord who is great and awesome and fight and and, and by remembering this would also encourage us to do what fight and fight for your families your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies, when we give in, we giving up all those things. Fight. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, listen to this. When our enemies were heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had did what? Frustrated it. Who did it? God had frustrated it. We all returned to the wall, each to our own work. When the enemy couldn't scare us and bully us and get us to turn around, they could not stop what God's will was. And what was happening? They returned to the wall. They continued to do God's work. 
from that day on. See, first of all, we, we got to remember, we got to show up every day and, and trust God. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. They had protection. They came to work, and with their work, they had protection. They were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were what? Building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held their weapon in the other hand. That is a picture of the way we should be walking here on earth. We should be doing God's will in our life, working for the Lord. And at the same time, we should be holding the sword our weapons, our spiritual weapons, God's word. See, God's word. We're working and we're holding to his word. Those two things enabled us to withstand all of the attacks that we have to face in this world, the ability and the commitment to working with a heart and a mind to work for the Lord and being equipped with the word of God. The word of God is, is his promises, is his testimony that he has given us, plus what he has already done for us. See, it's our prayers. It's all the things that, all the ways God has delivered us already and delivered his people. And it's his promises to deliver us at this present time and in the future. That's our weapon against our enemy. Our enemy cannot overcome God's word. It can't defeat his word, can't defeat his promises, can't defeat him. So when we are fighting with the right weapons and using the right weapons, we cannot be defeated. It's impossible. The battle is already won. But we have to be equipped. We have to be have the mind to work to get whatever it is we need done that God's called us to do, we purpose to do, and we have to have our weapons Oh, this, this is such a powerful scripture for believers who are building the wall. Those who carried the materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. My Lord. Verse 18, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. And all the people had their weapons with them as they worked. What is the weapon? God's word, God's promises, God's will. But the man, but, at, but in literal and, and, and literally at this time, they were literally had their swords. But now that speaks to us today being our spiritual weapons, God's word, God's will. See, this is very, very, this, this, this text um, can be very, be parallel easily with Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God so you can withstand the wiles of the devil. And when done all to stand, do what? Stand. Don't be afraid. <laughs> See, stand. Now, weapons are not what? Carnal. Oh, my Lord. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed what? With me. Person that would sound the trumpet. Now, we talk about a person that would sound the trumpet. Who would that be to us today as believers? That would be our spiritual advisors. That would be our pastors, our ministers, our spiritual leaders. They would sound the trumpet because they would see and they would know the attack of the enemy. When they see the attack, they blow the horn. They begin to give you, hey, I'm warning you, all the prophets, think of the prophets, they sounded the trumpet, the watchmen. Repent, turn from your wicked ways, do this, do that. They deliver God's word. They sounded the trumpet, they sounded the alarm. And when the alarm was sound, when you hear God's words, God's warning, God's strategies, God's guidance, then we are to what? Rally around his word to attack what? Our enemy. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. My Lord. 
We got to keep ourselves into God's word. Bible studies, church services, or reading the word, or whatever way we are guided and led and taught or given the word. Keep it near. Keep it near you. Keep it in your life. Keep God's word in your life. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. All right? They got to do a lot of stuff. They got to cover a lot of ground that they are spread out. But it's okay. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, when you hear God's word, when you hear his guidance, his strength, his warning, his knowledge, what does it say? Our God will what? Fight for us. See, our, our weapons are not carnal. We have to show up and we have to be prepared to do God's work and to do God's will. But the one thing we don't need to worry about is we don't need to worry about the enemy that, that, that's attacking us, our opposition, the person that we fight. We don't need to worry about the odds that may seem to be just us or we the few people that we have don't seem to be enough myself, yourself, uh, with God is more than enough. As long as we got God on our side, we are with God, we have enough. Because we have his promise, we have his promise. Now, I just told you we have to have our weapons. What is our weapon? What is our weapon that we have in our uh, arrow holder that holds our arrows that we can shoot? We have the promise that our God will fight for us. It says somewhere else in the Bible, say you will not need to fight in this battle. <laughs> when you go before the Pharaoh, tell him that I am sent you. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. All things work to the good of those who love the Lord. See, all these are weapons that we have to fight the opposition that comes against us. We have to have our weapons. Our God will fight for us. Then verse 21 says, so we continue to work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars come out. At that, they were from morning to night. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so that they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. See, they were not allowed to go home because their homes were outside of the wall. So they were, they had to make a sacrifice to stay at, on the battleground for the Lord. Neither I, verse 23, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off their clothes. Each had his weapon. We could not take off our armor at no point in time. Cannot take it off. Even when he went, what, for water. Now, that concludes our reading of our text. But I want to go back to a couple of verses. But before I, I go, I want us to go back to verse 20. Whatever you hear the sound of the trumpet, that means God's word, God's horn. You hear God's blowing his horn and say, hey, this and that, whatever way God is, is calling us, what the word is saying to us, where he is guiding us where he's telling us, where he's alarming us, where he's giving us his word and, and, and his cause, then we need to rally to it. We need to join him there. We need to, we need to go to his word and hear his word and hear his will. And when we go 
when we, we, we go where God sends us, know that our God will fight for what? Us. See, when you go to where God has called you, you're doing what God has, has guided you to do, then you carry, he gives you a promise that he will fight for us, that you will be successful. Now, when you go, more than likely, in the appearance of it all, is that you don't have enough. That what you have to face is, is much bigger than you. See, it's much bigger than you. But I challenge you to stretch. The only way you can stretch who you are and live an extraordinary life, being an ordinary person, which we all are, but live an extraordinary life is by faith. Because by faith, you can do and you, you do things that are bigger than you. You connect yourself with things that are bigger than you. And that's what our life as faithful walkers are, as I believe us are, to live a life that's bigger than us. That don't mean like we, we try to be richer than what we live by resources like we don't have. We try to live like a millionaire when we are, you know, thousandaire or whatever. I don't mean that. Try to act like you're rich when you're not, you know, those type of things. Try to be something that you're not from the materialistic perspective. No, that means you walk in faith and you you go and you can you 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 do things you you go where God has called you to do to go to help in your community to to help in your church. God calls you to causes and the things that appear bigger than you. And when you're called to those things, then he will equip you. He will give you what you need. He will guide you. He will strengthen you to make an impact on whatever it is, the cause that you've been called to. And now all of a sudden you're living your life, living a life that's bigger than you. When we look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah is the perfect example of this because when we go back to the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, not chapter four at the beginning, Nehemiah had a, he had a gravy job. He didn't have a job where he had to be super intelligent. In other words, he didn't have a job where he was academically privileged or he was super talented in a particular skill or he had a great job, but it was a job that was, it was a servant job. But he was just so happy to be serving to the king, to the ruler of Babylon. See, the Median Persian Empire, I should say. He was the cupbearer. In other words, he was his servant, his slave. His job was to drink or eat, in particular drink the wine or anything that the, the king would drink before the king drank. So if it was poison, it would kill the by him getting sick and dying, the king would live. Not a job many people would want to have. But he had the presence of the king and the trust of the king because of the job that he had. So it wasn't anything special about Nehemiah from the perspective of talent, academics, family name, or anything. He was just a person that was doing his job. So I want that to be clear to us because now knowing this and understanding this, now we see that he was, he heard some news about his hometown. And when he heard the news, it just didn't sit right with him. He heard that he, he had the curiosity. See, he never lived in Israel. He never lived in Jerusalem and Judah. He was born in captivity. But I guess he always wanted to know and wanted to feel good about his heritage and the history that it had 
in Judah and Jerusalem and, and, and the great times and the great people and the great nation that it once was. So you ask someone who had been to Jerusalem, how are the people in Jerusalem? How are my people? And the man gave him a bad report. The walls were torn down. They, they, were, they, they, they had no safety. They had no security. They, had, they were weak and they were being taken advantage of. And it was just sad. It was a sad state of events. It's kind of his nation that he never visited, but he was a part of by, by blood, was in a fallen state. And it just didn't sit right with him. See, something, to some people, they can hear that and it don't bother them. You hear your people in, in your old neighborhood, in your community, in the schools that our schools, our kids go to, people of our color go to, and and their commun communities, oh, it's bad, it's, it's dilapidated, they're killing each other, there's lack of knowledge, there's crime everywhere, our children are this and that. Some of us as African-American hear that and don't even bother. And they can continue to live their life the same way, not even, not even bother. But some of, all of, of us can hear that and it we can't get right with it. We are drawn. It, it doesn't settle well with us. And see, we are the people that God is calling to do something about it. Maybe he is calling us to connect ourselves to something that's bigger than us. And that's what Nehemiah, he heard it and he just couldn't get right with it and it bothered him to the point where it began to affect how he looked in the presence of the king. So the king asked him, what's wrong? Why are you counting this down? Your, 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 your heart must be sad. Because obviously the king would notice anything about Nehemiah very quickly because he always watched him carefully because he knew that he was drinking the stuff that he had to drink before he drank it. So when he started to look crazy, then the king started, hey, wait a minute. He's not looking right. All right. So he noticed and he asked him, and he he made, he told his king, uh, the king, what was bothering him. It was this country. It was torn down. How can he be happy when his nation that he as a part of is in, in such a bad state? The Bible says that he gained favor with the king, my Lord. It says the hand of the Lord was with Nehemiah. It says that. Read it. Chapter 1, chapter 2. And that's a big thing because we talked about that last week. The hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord. That means the favor of God. See, when, when we when we are, are called to a particular cause and we begin to walk in that calling that we have, then once we start walking, then the hand of the Lord goes with us. And then all of a sudden we gain favor. And then as we go and move in the, in the direction he's calling us, God gives us his favor. He gives us things that we can't imagine, like the king agreed to give you all the resources you need to, to get there safely, protection, and the resources you need to accomplish the goal. He will finance the cause that you were called to do. The king agreed to finance rebuilding it and give him his protection. Out the blue. So when he said he wanted to do what uh, to affect his hometown, rebuild his hometown, when he was thinking this, he had no idea how in the world, just think about it. How is me just a little worker, a little part-time worker, a full-time worker, or a media worker, a middle-class worker, whatever, can go and rebuild a whole nation, a wall around Jerusalem to a place I've never been. Think of the magnitude of that thought. But look what happened. When he acted, when he was given the opportunity to, to act on what he was, what bothered his spirit and what he was feeling called to do, the Lord hand was, he made a way. And see how much of an impact would we make as believers, people who would have the opportunity to live in that community, to go to a particular school and grow 
from that and to other places of life then be called to do something to help the community that you left. What if, just think of the impact that will have on the, those communities, with all the people that were called out of those communities wanting to reach out and help those that were there. Just think about it. It's on table one, the right one. And we see that in this story. This ordinary person has been called to do something that's bigger than him. It's bigger than him, but it's just right for God. God called him to it. He just walked in it. Is there not a cause? Oh, my God. You think about that. That's the challenge that David said in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 17, you read it. When he walked in and heard the threats of an uncircumcised giant, and he, it challenged him. What? This man is defying the armies of the living God. He was called to do something about that. And then he got the doubt, just as they got the doubt. His brother, what are you coming down here for? You always coming down here. And he told his brother, is there not a what? cause are you connected to something that's bigger than you or are you just living your life for yourself God calls us for a purpose and our purpose is not to just make ourselves better to do only for ourselves. So we see now that Nehemiah has been called and given all the resources, the hand of the Lord is with us, him. Now he is in Judah, at Jerusalem. And he has all these resources, but now when he gets ready to do what he's called to do, guess what? The opposition jumps up and shows his head. And when we are moved to help and to, to work for the Lord and do things for God and to cause us, the enemy will show itself immediately. And look how it started off. When Sam Battle, who was the governor of that region at that time, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, coming back to do something good and positive and, and, and help, he became angry. <laughs> and greatly incensed the devil does not want us to restore and to rebuild what was destroyed and he will attack us so what was the, the so the first thing we know that 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 will people will get angry so when somebody get mad because you're trying to do something right, expect it, pray for them. And that's one important point in this text as well. When the enemies of Nehemiah came to him, he prayed to God, but he prayed to God for to judge them. Now in the New Testament, Jesus has instructed us to to live on a higher level of prayer when we talk about our enemies. Jesus instructed, see, this is Old Testament. They prayed for justice to God to be just, for God's judgment upon them. But in New Testament, it says what? Pray for your enemies. <laughs> I know it. That, that hits you, don't it? Pray for your enemies. So we are called to a higher level. So those that come up against us, we do not should pray prayers for them to be harmed or hurt or whatever. But we are praying for their salvation. For their spirit. That they are saved. And just give me some ideas because you, you probably wonder, what am I going to pray for my enemy? Just give me a few ideas. So 
there's opposition and we have to expect opposition. If you do not have opposition, that means that you are successfully going down the wrong road. <laughs> Find the right road. You're going down the wrong road because people will let you go 150 miles per hour down the wrong road to destruction. They will not stop you because they're just going to watch you destroy or to your destruction. But when you are going 150 miles per hour down the road of success and of righteousness and of God, all they're going to get many and find ways to get in your way to stop you. So they became angry and then they began to use sarcasm. All right. They began to, when you use sarcasm you and you, and you begin to mock them, then you are doing one of Satan's most uh, valuable, he's using one of his most valuable strategies and methods against you. That's designed to give you doubt. Look what he said. He says, he ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of the, his associates, they all, the army of Samaria got his little army together. They could attack him now. You, you should wonder well, why that the army was there, why they just attack and kill the uh, Nehemiah and his, his group of workers. They couldn't. Because he had the protection of what? The king. He had letters from the king. You can't do nothing to him. Ah. So that also should strengthen us to know that we have God's protection. He may come and he may wolf. He may throw his things. He may do all these evil things, but he cannot defeat you. Because if he comes up against you, the Lord will destroy him because you have a purpose for God. You're working for God. So when he attacks you, he's attacking God. And God will fight our battle. He will fight for us. He says, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burn as they are? In other words, he's saying this is you, you guys are so small and insignificant and nobodies. Can you build a wall that can do something so great and powerful and strong? Build a wall that can protect this city? No. Under normal circumstances, you cannot. But with the favor of God, with the promises of God, you can. And we have to always remember and keep our eyes on God because if we listen to the naysayers and the doubt and the, look at the circumstance, we will fall victim to the, 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 the methodology of Satan to, to create doubt. And when doubt creeps in, you begin to have people lose heart, begin people turn back, stop doing it because they, they don't believe that they can do it. I believe. I believe. That's why we should believe. I believe. And I act on what I believe. That shows my faith. So then they all jump in. When Sam Ballard said then Tobiah jump in, even a fox jump on that wall, it'll fall. Like the work y'all doing ain't even good anyway. It's gonna, it ain't gonna stand. Whatever you're trying to do in this community, it ain't gonna last. These people are gonna put you down and take your stuff and do whatever and you're gonna send you on. And then what does Nehemiah do? He prays. And he prays that God judge these people. And that's a, a good prayer for that time in the history of, of, of God's uh, will. Because it's the Old Testament. Now we are charged to do more. We know better. So we pray for our enemies now. <laughs> and then once he began to pray, the very th next thing says, and, we, I, and I want to encourage us to be prayer. When the opposition comes up against us, when we go into what God has called us to do, and the things become big, and all these things come up, pray. Trust your prayers. Trust God. Give it to God. And once you give it to God, you work. I believe, believe in, in God, and then you act. Verse 4, he prayed. Verse 5, he prayed. Verse 6, he worked. So we built the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people had a heart to work. Don't let that get past you. They worked. Once we pray, we are equipped. 
our prayer life has to be strong. And if you you don't feel like your prayer life is strong right now, it's okay. The great thing about it is that you perceive it. Now, what could you do? Pray more. Pray more. And know that the that who you are praying to will fulfill your prayers. He hears you. But our prayer life is generally weak because we don't pray enough or we don't believe in our own prayers. Pray more. If you look at all the people that have done things for Christ, one united thing that they had was prayer. We have to pray because what we are doing is bigger than us. It's bigger than us. When we, when we walk in faith, we're not doing something we know we can do. I know I can... I can um, shoot a basketball from the three-point line and make six out of ten shots every time. I, I, I'm not trusting God for that. Now, what I have to trust him for is to be able to get a team that can shoot the ball, other men that can work together and shoot a ball and accomplish a goal on a basketball court together. That is bigger than me. So now I need, I have to, I know I have to rely on faith because that's bigger than me. See, faith is not uh, doing something you know you can do or that's already, no. Faith is trusting and believing in the things that is bigger than you. Now you have to trust God for it to come to pass. And that begins with prayer. See, that's one of the number one weapons we have against what we have to face, praying. Nehemiah prayed. He prayed from the beginning of this book all the way to the end. Prayer. And every time he prayed, it led to action. It led to results. And the same will come in our life. Pray. So they built the wall. And then it says they, the, the Bible made, a writer made a point to say he got what? Half way there. And I think he's one of the things that I glean from that and I take from that is once we get started and we get it going, many times we give ourselves to Christ and we 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 start doing the things we want to do and we're seeing God moving our life and seeing the things come together that we never thought would come together and they're coming together and we got good momentum going. And about halfway there, bing, oh, Jack, guess who shows back up again? The enemy. The enemy shows back up again. See, Sam Ballard coming back now. They don't got it halfway done. Here comes Sam. It says, but. So they, they had all this momentum. Then you hear the but in verse 7. That means that, okay, here comes the opposition. Sam Ballard, Tobiah, and all his, his, his ites that were with him. <laughs> all the different ites. Ites, I'm sorry. They were with him. When they saw the, the progress was being made. They plotted all together to come and fight against Jerusalem and do what? Stir up trouble. Their fight, they could not fight them directly because they had protection from the king. Everybody should be saying glory, hallelujah. They can't, see, let me give you a prime example of that so you know that, that, that that's also talking to you. When they was talking about Job up in heaven, they had a meeting of all the angels up in heaven. And they, he, he, he talked about, he said, where you been going? To and fro, looking on the earth. He said, how you considered my servant Job? He said, yeah, I consider him, but you got a hedge around him. Ooh. <laughs> See, Satan can only do so much without the permission of God. So when he has a head, see, it only when we are protected by the king, your enemy, the enemy that comes can only go so far because we are protected by what? The king, the orders of the king, the orders of the complete, almighty, sovereign God. So what did they do? They couldn't fight him, so then they began to do what? Stir up trouble against it. Miss. They start trying to send miss and, and, and all those different things 
and discouragement. Tried to discourage him. Another one of Satan's greatest tools to us when we are trying to do something. Discouragement. But verse 9, I love it. What did, when opposition came up against them again, what did Nehemiah do? But he prayed. It says, we prayed. They prayed united to our God. And once they prayed, they acted. They posted guards day and night to meet this, what, three threat. And then here comes the, the threats. And here comes the discouragement. It said they became tired. The strength of the laborers were given out. You're going to get tired on this road sometime. And then all of a sudden, now, all the rubbish that we have in our life becomes a factor. All the things that we need to rid ourselves from now becomes very heavy on us because we're tired. So now we have to make the decision to get rid of the things that are holding us down. You go back to, to Romans, where, where Paul tells us to, 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 to lay aside all the heavy weights. We have to, 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 do, to, to run for Christ. To win this race, we have to lay aside the heavy weights. Don't be discouraged. Move the rubbish. It's going to be there. The things in life that prevent us from walking and, and winning this race. We have to do it. But I can assure you it's for the good. It's for your good. And you will be so much, your life will be so much better releasing and getting rid of some of the things that have us bound, that are holding us down, that's weighing us down. It could be bad relationships. It can be so many things. When we walk in and we're living for things that are bigger than Christ and God calls us to higher levels and do mighty things because of our faith and the cause that he has called us to, we have to get rid of the rubbish or the rubbish will prevent us and discourage us from, from, from reaching our goal. And then once we do that, here come the threats. We're going to kill you. That's a threat. They can't attack them because they know before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to that work. Satan's going to send that to you. He's going to send that to you. Look at all the people. We're going to kill Jesus. We're going to kill all the disciples. We're going to kill all the believers in Christ. Yes, those are threats that will come our way. And they came to all the believers from Christ and they're going to come to us as well. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And then not only did that come from outside, it began to come from the, also from the people inside. Many times the people that are closest to us are not going to, to, to believe like we is, and they're going to send the same threats. You know why? It could be your brother, sister, mother, closest friends. They can be like, why are you doing this? You know that you nobody was able to do this. They're going to get you. They got everybody else. Blah, 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 blah. I can tell you, one of the hardest things for new believers to, to, to deal with, especially like people who come to Christ and they're the only one in their family that comes. It can be a, 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 a teenager, a young adult or whatever, child, they come to Christ and they begin living a born again life, but their parents are not Christian. And then they see the life that their child is living and it, that convicts them. It makes them be look more of a sinner because they are not a believer and they're doing all the things they want to do. And he's doing a he or she's doing the right thing, and making them look. And what do they do? They persecute the, the child. Why are you doing all that? All oh, that stuff and this and that, this and that. Your, your parents. I'm just using this as an example, but that's this real life situation, or your brothers or your sisters. They begin to send also the threats that come up against you. That can come from anywhere, but we have to keep our eyes focused on God promise and the cause and we have to face this opposition the opposition to prevent us to do to live a life that's bigger than us to do the things that God has called us to do to make the changes in the world that our spirit is guiding us to 
See, these are all the things that we glean from the book of Nehemiah. That's why it's so important that even though we think we know the story of Nehemiah, which we do know that the big things about Nehemiah, we still need to study it because it's the, it's the small things. It's the small things that strengthen us and equip us. Like this message should be strengthening us and equipping us to go in the direction and cause that Jesus is calling us to, despite the opposition that we will face, understanding that we will have opposition. But do not be afraid. Do what? Remember. Remember what? Remember the promises of God. Remember what he's done for all the people that has done and moved and acted on his cause and lived for him. Remember how they were successful and how he rewarded them and how he protected them and how he guided them, how he strengthened them, how he brought them through. Your Daniels, your Davids, your Moseses, your Joshuas, see, your Abrahams, your Pauls, see, so many people, Peter, your Johns, all those people, the Lord has strengthened. Our grandparents, our parents, our our people that we know in the community, all oh, so many people that God has strengthened and delivered and saw to, to reaching their cause for the Lord, their champions for God. Remember, remember the things that he has brought you through already. Brought you from whatever situation that we were born in to where you are right now. Remember some of the situation that you had to go through in life with, with in positions of a lack, not having enough. Don't know how you're going to make it. But somehow, some way, it came to pass. That was God. Remember how he brought us through sickness. Remember how he brought us through times where we were alone or outcast or persecuted, all those things. See, many times, when we go through life, God doesn't take the danger away. He doesn't calm the storm that we may be in in life. He doesn't send the enemies that come against us uh, away and just get, removes them away. Many times he doesn't do that. But what he does is he gives us peace in the storm. <laughs> oh, so now we got our weapon. He gives us peace in the storm. He gives us a peace that we know that we got this in the midst of all the opposition that we have in the face. We got this. The covenants know that we got this. See, they, these workers and Nehemiah had to continue to put in the work and trust him and understand that God has their back and he has our back as well, no matter what comes our way. And in doing so, this deepens our relationship with Christ. And in this process, we grow stronger to Christ and we, we know Christ in a, in a mightier way. And then the more we know Christ and, and the deeper we know Christ and the mightier we know Christ, the more unbelievable things that we are able to do because we know how unbelievable our God is. The power and the strength of our God. I believe I act equals my faith. Walk in the direction God is calling you to. You will have opposition. Oh, so many things will come against you, but do not be afraid. Pray and work. Pray and go. Carry, have a heart to work and be working with one hand and have your weapon in the other hand. That's God's word. God promises. Have your prayers, your spiritual warfare, put on your whole armor of God and watch and see the life, how big your life is. How big your life is because you'll be living for something that's bigger than you. You can be a regular person that's not even an architect and you can build a wall around a city that no one thought could be done, that wasn't done. Why was it such a amazing? No one had done it. They had been in captivity 150 years. Nobody had built it back in 150 years. This man had came who was a cupbearer. He didn't have an architect degree. He didn't have a soldier degree. He didn't have no degree. But he had God. He had the promise of God. He had the faith in God, the belief in God. 
And look what he was able to do. That same God is waiting for us to trust him. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we come here today, Lord. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. Lord, we pray right now that you remove the rubbish from our life so that we can hear you better. Lord, we pray that you heal us of blindness so that we can see you better, so that we know the causes and the, and the, and the, and the direction that you're calling our lives to and our efforts and our work to, so that we can go in that direction and give and have a heart to work in the areas in this world and our communities and the life and the environment around us to do your will. Lord, you have called all of us for a purpose, and that is to do your will. So, Lord, we're praying that you guide us, strengthen us, protect us as we go, dear Lord, and that we fulfill all that you, you have purpose for us to fulfill in this life. And, Lord, that it affects the community around us and our families and, and the people around us, dear Lord. Lord, help us to live a life that's bigger than us because that's what you have called us to. And Lord, we just want to say thank you, Lord. We be sure to give you all the credit and the glory, dear Lord. We just want to say thank you. And Lord, as we leave here today, Lord, we're praying for a special blessing of each and every household that's on this, uh, that hears this message, dear Lord. I pray for their homes and their families, Lord, and their endeavors and in their life and all the things that they have in life, Lord. I ask that you bless it and that your hand of favor goes with them and that the hand of the Lord be with them in all things. Lord, we just want to say thank you. We're asking all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everyone. Also, I'd like to wish a belated happy birthday to dear Evans, my brother. He had a birthday last week, July 14th. Didn't say it before, but I'm saying it now. Happy birthday. God bless. It's always a blessing to see another birthday. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining in on our Bible study. And I pray that God bless you in, in the word that was given today. And... Happy birthday, Derek Evans. Great lesson, Reverend Evans. Thank you. To God be the glory. Thank you. Good to see you, Dr. Lane. Yes. Great lesson, Reverend Evans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lane. And on that note, I want to leave everyone with the watchword of Christ. Peace. 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 Peace.